Hi, I'm Hans Meter with the National Center for College and Career Transitions. Welcome to today's web briefing, Mountain Home High School, a Rural Success Story. Mountain Home High School is the senior high school for the Mountain Home Public School District located in the rural setting of Mountain Home, Arkansas. The Mountain Home School District encompasses approximately 330 square miles and serves more than 4,000 students from kindergarten through grade 12. In the early 2000s, leadership of Mountain Home was concerned about lagging graduation rates and increased student discipline referrals. So they decided to set out on a process to find an effective school improvement model. Over several years, they launched a process to learn about school improvement models and to begin implementing and they settled on the model of the Career Academy. So as part of this series, we've invited representatives from Mountain Home to explain the work that they have done. In part one, we will cover the history of the school, why they chose to implement the Academy's model, and how that change took place. In part two of the series, we will address the community involvement factors. In part three, we will focus on hearing the student perspective, and in part four, hearing directly from teachers who are involved in the school's career academies. We've invited Dana Brown, principal for Mountain Home High School, to present to us today, and Bridget Shipman, who is the academy coordinator, to present in part two, the discussion of community integration. Ms. Brown is the principal of Mountain Home High School career academies. She has overseen the research and development and implemented wall-to-wall -wall career academies in grades 10 through 12 and also partnered with the junior high school to develop the program's freshman academy. She has presented at many national conferences about the work of Mountain Home and how they've implemented the career academy model in a rural setting and she has received the Ford Foundation's National Designation of Leadership in High School Redesign at the professional level in a rural setting. So we're very delighted to hear from Ms. Brown today. I'll turn it over to you now, Dana. Thank you for the opportunity for us to share our story. And at Mountain Home High School Career Academies, we really do embrace the process of reflecting on past practices and best practices, on revising what it is that we do each and every year. And we always remember to re-energize and celebrate our pieces of work that worked well, and then revisit the ones and re-energize and decide what does work best. When looking at designing and redesigning a high school, we really did embrace the quote at the bottom of this slide by Peter Drucker. Systematic change requires a willingness to look on change as an opportunity, and I think that really does embrace the work that we've done at Mountain Home High School Career Academies because the way that you look at the change is extremely important. When we began our research, we had input from our community. Um, we had a a company that was looking at possibly having uh, a retiring workforce. We had our hospital that said, you know, we really want to keep some of our graduates. We also looked within our system to decide, you know, what are we doing to help our kids graduate? Um, and are we keeping them engaged in class? Not only are we keeping them engaged, you know, to, to transition, but what, are, what is it that we could be doing better to help the students really find, you know, their learning relevant. So what we did is we researched different models, and the one that just kept coming back and really, really hit the needs of our community and our students was the Career Academy model. We took a group of people, uh, of different stakeholders in the community as well as within our school, to South Grand Prairie in South Grand Prairie, Texas. And I really think that involving all of the different voices has been really a key to our success. 
I say it all the time, people support what they help create. So I think within the research and implementation from the very beginning, having all those voices heard was a really critical piece. Within this design, we looked at how we actually did high school. We looked at modeling our, our school, our existing schools. We had to really reflect on our programs of study. We had to look at the size of our faculty to actually fit in the different academies. What could we support? Because when we went to South Green Prairie, they had over 2,500 students in their, in their school, and that was grades 10 through 12. Well, Mountain Home comes from a rural setting. And so one thing that we really had to decide in the very beginning is what best practices are we going to bring back from South Green Prairie that fits the needs of our students, of our faculty and our community. And so that was really the piece that we looked at when we redesigned our high school. We looked at um, three academies versus six at South Grand Prairie. So within that, we decided to look at faculty um, selection. They told me which academies they were really interested in and if I put them in a specific academy that they would absolutely quit. So we really did look at how the adults in our school learned so that they were able to fit the needs of the learning styles of our students in that particular academy. Um, academy leader selection, this is a teacher, totally teacher empowered model. We really empower our teachers to develop integrated projects and have a voice, it's very important. We worked on in the beginning, in the research, how are we going to work on team building? Because you just can't throw people in a room and say, okay, you get to collaborate. We really focused on how it is that they work together as a team and build that culture within each of the academies as teachers. Now, each of the things that we did, we didn't just do everything all at once. We phased pieces in each year. We didn't just tackle everything at once. And I think that was one of the reasons that we have been able to sustain over the last couple of years is because we focus on one thing at a time. We did create academy identities. The things, the two key practices that we focused on at that time were the National Career Academy, National Standards of Practice, and the high schools that work, key practices that we, those were the two um, pieces of research that we really embraced when we looked at this change. So after we did the research, after we took several people to South Grand Prairie, not only did we take school board members, we took community partners, um, we took uh, an engineer from Baxter Healthcare, we took our central office because we know that we needed to have that support, we took board members, we took teachers, we took counselors. So we took every opportunity to provide a voice and the opportunity to see, because when you see things in action, it makes a little bit more sense whenever you're focusing on a high school redesign. So with that bit of research, we developed looking at our programs of study, looking at our community, how could we filter if we did decide, students did decide to transition into the workplace or to choose which area they wanted to go to college. These were the three academies that we really focused on. We first started with ACME, which is Architecture, Construction, Manufacturing, and Engineering. We also have CAB, Communication, Arts, and Business, and we have Health and Human Services, or HHS. And those are our three small learning communities, if you will, or career academies that we have in place at Mountain Home High School. I think that building shared leadership is truly the key to our success. I believe that we have embraced the model of understanding as a principal, understanding that I don't have all the answers, understanding that people support what they help create, and keeping with the spirit of the integrity of hearing other people's voices, really making sure that the teachers embrace what it is that they're working with, but then as a leader to build that trust with those teacher leaders to be able to understand, as Rick DeFore tells us, you need to learn when to have tight leadership and you need to learn when to be loose. And so I think by really embracing this philosophy has been a 
critical point in our, our success in, in sustaining since 2001. So some of the leadership components that are very important is the relationship between myself and my academy coordinator, Bridget Shipman. That is a piece where, you know, as a principal, you have certain job duties that you have to, to maintain. The academy coordinator is the person that is really the director over the academy system. And so we work very closely. So the relationship that I have with Bridget is extremely important because, again, being a leader of a building and saying that, you know, you're, the buck stops with you, so to speak, you really have to build that element of trust with that person. And so that relationship is extremely important. The communication that we have is extremely important. Um, selecting teacher leaders, you know, and any faculty throughout the, you know, throughout the nation, they, you are going to know which teachers are going to be able to organize that the other teachers respect and they can lead and coordinate. So selecting teacher leaders is very important when redesigning into these small learning communities or career academies. Remembering that the freshman transition bridge is extremely important because our campus, the way that it's configured, our ninth grade center is on a completely different campus. And so really building that bridge between high school and junior high was very critical for us. I think that is with any, any area, that transition, any time that you transition from building to building or building to the post-secondary plan, those key pieces are very important. Making sure that the, those teacher leaders are comfortable in their roles, providing them with um, professional development so that they're able to lead, and really providing them with the support is critical. We provide them with um, leadership training, whether it be um, bringing in a mentor, as we brought in Billy Donegan, who we met early on in our process, to help re, you know, to rejuvenate our leaders with professional development to, you know, to kind of figure out what it is they need to improve on when leading their academy. Also, Sandy Middlestat has been critical in helping with mentoring our professional development for um, teaching our teacher leaders how to lead. Again, we still embrace the, um, the philosophy of reflecting what it is that we need to do better, what did we do good, what needs to be improved on, revising it, and then celebrating our successes. So that's a really key point. When we started this particular process, it, 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 you can't do it alone. You have to have the support of all of those stakeholders that are on this slide right now. Um, with between now, when we started in 2001 to present time, we've had different district leadership. We've had board members that have come on and off the board. We've had two different superintendents. And if we did not have the support from our State Department, our Arkansas Department of Career Education, and if we didn't have the support and the relationship that we have with NCAC and Jan Strubing and the people and Susan Katzman that have really mentored us with NCAC, we would not have been able to sustain. Our community, you know, as we've built our Career Academy model, our community component really becomes a lot more critical because they're owning their school. They see, they see ownership in what it is they've done because of the key pieces that we have implemented throughout the model. If we had not embedded our community the way that we have, I truly believe that we would not have sustained as long as we have. Um, parental support, always very important. We have very strong uh, par uh, partners in education program where we, you know, our, our parents come in and we have a very active parent organization. Again, building leadership, you really do have to have, as a principal, you have to be able to let go and to trust and to allow teachers to lead. And so I think that that's, you don't have all of these pieces together, working together. I, again, I think that's one of the critical components as to why we have been able to sustain. Um, again, we really, our go-to uh, for resources is the National Career Academy Coalition. They have a, an assessment that they do, you know, within, you know, three to five year process. And we recently went through the evaluation process 
and there are three different levels that you can attain in this in this model and in this assessment and you it, it's pretty much unheard of that all three of your academies are going to make the highest level so the first level is in progress where that means you're hitting some of the high points of the NCAC model and mirroring the best practices somewhat then they're certified and certified means that you are meeting the requirements as set out to the national standards but you could improve on them and model status means that's the highest level that you can achieve meaning that you are exceeding the standards and the requirements to meet those particular standards and I'm really excited to say that we did receive model status on every academy that we have at Mountain Home High School. So HHS, CAP, and ACME all are considered model status. Within, again, we have to pull support in where we can, again, because we're a rural community. So whenever we attended NCAC, the conference, we found a, a piece of, of information which allowed us to write a grant and go through an assessment through the Ford Foundation, the philanthropic arm of Ford Motor Company. And when we went through this assessment, you know, we had uh, Sandy Middlestat actually came and um, did our assessment, which was very intimidating because, you know, she wrote the book on, mm -hmm. on Career Academy. So for this lady that we've watched, you know, and really aspired to be like at, to come and actually evaluate our program was huge for us. And so whenever, again, we hit the highest level that you can receive with the assessment at, um, so we did receive the designation of professional level in setting for high school redesign, which we were very excited about. So that means that our community is really embracing our best practices. From the Ford Foundation, we pulled these three main components for our best practices. So what that means is that Sandy Middlestat and Rick Bellino actually came and mentored us through the process to build a, a strong and thriving teacher externship program where our teachers actually go out into our community for professional development, figure out how that particular business fits within their frameworks, bring it back, and figure out how to integrate it into a project. Rick Delano helped us to develop our model for the Business Advisory Board, which Bridget's going to um, fill you guys in um, a little bit later in part two. And then also the Ford Pass curriculum was one of the pieces that we have utilized to help build in the beginning our um, our integrated projects. So they're ready-made curriculum to help kind of spur on the teachers and help them to develop integrated projects. Um, our Arkansas Department of Career Education has been a huge partner with us. We were the showcase site for the state of Arkansas in 2009, which means that we've had several schools, not only in the state of Arkansas, come to us and we mentor them so that we are able to help share our story and help mentor them as they decide to redesign their high schools into the Career Academy model. We are a conversion charter school, and what that means is that we, have, we still operate under the same accountability measures that every school in the state of Arkansas operate under, meaning that our test scores have to be remediated, we have to make sure that we meet um, our AYP or our adequate yearly progress. But what is what is so nice about the waiver is it allows us to support our career academy model with what is called waivers. So what we have written our waivers to help support the career academy model are, are the items that you see on, um, on the slide, which is flexible scheduling. Um, we group our ninth grade and eighth grade algebra population so that it shows as one um, population for our adequate yearly progress. We also offer alternative credit. Our internship is part of our waiver. Um, our freshman transition academy, since it's on a separate campus, some of the things that we do to encourage them to be a part of the career academy model is part of the waiver. And then we have a transition room for credit recovery so that students 
are able to transition from the junior high to the high school without having um, with to help them and build that support for credit recovery. Now the common planning time and the flexible scheduling is one of our key pieces because if you want teachers to be able to really embrace this model, they have to have the time and the opportunity to collaborate and to show them that you feel like as a leader, an instructional leader of your building, that that is important and that's what you feel is important. So every Wednesday, two academies will meet from eight to nine while the other academy covers our remediation piece. That may be um, covering our state required remediation, but also our point in time remediation that students are, are having problems um, like D's or F's in some of our core classes and they're able to get a, you know assistance during that time as well. But the, that particular common planning time is critical. It's one of those non-negotiables with our academy model because you truly do have to give teachers that professional development time so that they are able to develop the integrated projects necessary to make this work. Within that time, they work on integrated project development over a theme for each year. We also model, um, we pick out from our state test weak student learning expectations and to give ownership to every person to those test scores, what we do is we identify from math and literacy and biology, those are our three high stakes areas. We ask the teachers to show us what weak student learning expectations are there and then they have to figure out in the other curricular areas, how can I help support that weak student learning expectation in my classroom. We also use the best practice from high schools that work, which is tuning protocols where teachers in a safe environment are able to share an, a, a lesson, they present it to their group and they get warm and cool feedback to help them to you know, better improve their lesson mm -hmm. and to maybe add some things or take away some things. So it's really a, a, a very positive time for teachers to provide that feedback to help their colleagues you know, to improve the lesson. Um, we red flag students. We have those students that are attached to an academic advisory teacher, and that's kind of their go-to person to be able to, you know, if they're struggling in classes or you feel like they're struggling personally, then they're able to, um, with the red flag, red flag system that we have in place, um, our students are able to get those needs met. We do have business partners that will attend to help um, develop some of our integrated projects. And then we've also put in place a parent panel where you can actually get um, discussions with parents to figure out what they feel is important and what their needs to see if we are meeting their needs um, within this model. As you can see, over the last couple of years, Mountain Home High School has been well above the state and national averages on the ACT score. With our mission and vision statement, our mission statement is committed to excellence in education. Our vision is every student, every time. And if you can see on this slide, we've listed our belief statement. It really does tie in with the Career Academy National Standards of Practice, as well as the high, school at, high schools at work, that work national standards of practice as well. The one thing within this model is that we want to keep reinforcing those standards of practice within our daily belief systems because if teachers understand that it's not one more thing on their plate, it really does tie within our mission, vision, and belief as well as what National Career Academy says, the Career Academy Coalition, what they say is best practices for helping students um, to be more successful and to be ready to transition into college. Within our, tra our freshman transition, the key class that we have is Keystone. That's where the students actually get the opportunity to learn about themselves. They learn about their learning styles. They learn about what they like to do. And that helps them choose an academy. And we have some different pieces that we have felt have been very important for our freshmen, even though they're at a different campus, we provide an extended advisory period and a transition day to allow them to be on our campus 
so that they can go through the motions of actually being a high school student on our campus before they actually get here. So we do try to build in those particular support pieces and programs throughout the year to get them more familiar with our campus and how we, you know, how our uh, how our day works, what does your day look like type situation. Our academic advisory program is where we tie a lot of our transition pieces into because we have a vertical team that focuses on transition um, from grades 5 through 12 because that's in our configuration, that's where our students transition, you know, from building to building into different, you know, areas. So that's why we do feel like our freshman transition <coughs> support is very important because, again, because they're on a separate campus, we really want them to remember that is your most important year. June, that ninth grade year is your most important year. That's when your transcript starts. And just because you're at a different campus doesn't mean you're not in high school. So that's one of the biggest pieces that we really try to focus on. Another piece of our puzzle that really helps us is embedding our community even further is our mentoring program. Our mentors have been an extremely successful piece that we have embraced. Um, the first Wednesday of every month, we have community partners that come in and they partner with one of our academic advisory teachers. So we'll have over 100 business partners that come in from our community once a month. We ask them to stay with our 10th grade. They start with our 10th grade class, a 10th grade class, and they will follow that class until they graduate. So they really do build a relationship with our students and our students are able to understand why certain things are important or relevant out in the real world whenever we bring in those particular business partners as a mentor. It is career focused. It is on, um, you know, their interests and it follows again within our AAP curriculum. So if our teachers are doing a lesson on volunteerism, then we share that information with our business partner to kind of help them get ideas on what it is that they might bring to the table and their job, volunteerism. We also have them bring in, if they would like, guest speakers. We do provide an orientation because what we've learned is that just because we're comfortable being in front of kids doesn't mean that our business partners are comfortable being in front of kids. And so again, learning the education world versus the business world has been a huge learning point for us. So we wanted to provide support again to our community partners when they come in as mentors. So we provide an orientation. We provide them with lesson ideas and a schedule of what it is that we're going to be covering through the whole year. So that gives them an idea. And we do stick to that first Wednesday of the month. Every That way, as a business person, you can put that on your calendar, kind of like Rotary, where you know when your meetings are and you're able to, um, you know, commit to that one one Wednesday a month. We also have developed a mentoring manual, which is called Bridging the Gap, and we have it focused, or it has actually been showcased on two different national websites, as well as our Arkansas Department of uh, Career Education. One of the things that we are, where we re-energized was we were featured on CNBC Education Nation as um, a, town, a rural Arkansas town, how we rethought and redesigned our high schools. But the big piece was that we were one of 10 schools across the nation that they focused and showcased to show that we do look at solutions in education and we do look at high school different. And so I would just encourage anyone to go to either of the websites that are posted on the slide and um, really look at what our story is and how we really try to transition and give the support to our students so that they're able to transfer and make that transition to the post-secondary world, whether it's to college, whether it's to work, or you know, even to a technical center or the military. So we were very excited and humbled to have the opportunity to share our story um, with CNBC and um, so that way everybody could see, you know, some of the neat opportunities that our teachers and our community are providing for our students. 
Well, thank you, Dana. That's very, very exciting and very impressive. So um, as you were going through your presentation, a couple of things came to mind that I wanted to ask you about. And one is related to parents, one is related to your teachers, and then some general questions. So related to parents, in many rural areas, small towns, uh, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is, is uh, generational poverty. And where, where families have almost lost hope of improving lives for the next generation. And in some, some small towns that we've worked with, the way that plays out is that parents maybe don't encourage their students to attend school. Uh, they just don't see the value in it. Perhaps the parents are a little intimidated by the school experience, so they don't come in for parent-teacher conferences. And the students just adopt that low, set of low expectations that, that they're hearing from home. Uh, how do you work with parents to try to break that, that uh, generational low expectations so that students can be, and their parents can begin to envision a better future for themselves? I think it's, it's really about educating the parents and the students as to what we do and why we do what we do with the Career Academy model. I think that by educating them to let them know the relevance of if I am, if I have the opportunity to be, to have the internship class and I can actually see what it is and what opportunities that my community have to offer, then I think that that helps tie with that that poverty situation that we have within our community because our, our poverty, I mean, we have 50% um, free and reduced lunch in this area. And so we do understand poverty, especially like you said, in a rural setting. But I think what has really helped us is our community connection and embedding our community within our programs. And I'll give you an example. Our, uh, ASU Mountain Home, which is Arkansas State University, is the Mountain Home campus tied to the Arkansas State University campus in Jonesboro. They recently opened a technical center because they looked at the needs of our community and the areas that they really focused on was mechatronics, which really ties to Baxter Healthcare and some of our other industry where we're seeing that that population of some of the, the line workers or some of the lower level entry level jobs um, that workforce is retiring and so ASU Mountain Home recognized the need to bring in that career and technical center and so our students so mechatronics welding which welding has been a huge pool for some of our students that had began in the poverty area because you can make a lot of money they've seen if they go out on the oil rigs you know in other states or you know boiler maker or however you know it is whichever one of those trades so that, that's just two. Another is an automotive area that ASU's Mountain Home is focused on. So if you look at our community, our college is trying to hit the needs of the, those students as well as our other students that are interested in, you know, moving on to the college level. So it's hitting the needs of two different types of populations with that area. Our community also helps our Mountain Home Education Foundation to start up, they funded for our students. They, they gave scholarships for 30 juniors going in to be a senior, our seniors this year, and 30 seniors for you know, that, were, that graduated last year. They paid their tuition to the technical center. Mm -hmm. So they're able to actually you know, decide you know, here while they're in high school, is this really what I wanna do? But I think more importantly, what do I not like about this? I thought I might like it, but now, you know, mm, after I had the opportunity to be an intern or I got to go to the technical center, I really realized that, you know, HVAC may not be the right place for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think to go back to your question to kind of end with, you know, to kind of bring it, tie it all back together, I think that our community really assesses the needs of our kids and we try to educate our parents and showing them the opportunities that we can provide for their students to help them transition to be a more successful business person or college student, you know, to help them in the next level. So, you know, our partners in education are a pie. We do rely on our parents there to also help communicate to parents 
so again, bringing them into our, you know, into our world, so to speak, and educating our parents of all demographic areas, I think has been, you know, a real, a real positive and has really helped because right. again, you know, parents talk parent language. They know what the questions are that they had with their previous child. Mm-hmm. So I think by creating that safe space for them to come in and visit with us, whether it's through open house, whether it's through parent meetings that we host throughout the year, whether it's through having ASU Mountain Home come and talk to the FAFSA training and trying to get kids into, you know, college, whether it's, you know, staying here in Mountain Home and getting, you know, a two or four year degree that we offer here or going on. Great, great. So tell me, uh, the second question I had about teachers, you mentioned the, the role of teacher leaders in, in leading teams within the academies. What are one or two characteristics that, you, that a teacher would need to develop to be a more effective leader and that, that seem to be kind of the predominant areas that teachers have to develop to, to play that role? I think a couple of characteristics that teacher leaders need to really develop is being able to be a big picture thinker, to be able to not just have the tunnel vision just my class alone, but to be a, you know, a big picture thinker, to be able to help and support their colleagues as to how they're going to tie into an integrated project, for example. Um, I think they need to learn how to be good listeners. I think they talk less, listen more. I think that if they understand what it is, the reason that we've done what it is that we're doing is because for the kids and helping them to transition into that next step, I think that our teacher leaders really do help support each other to develop, you know, what learning style is it that I really need to focus on to help this particular group of skill kids? You know, what what is it that I'm going to be able to do? To, so big picture thinking, to mm-hmm. be able to not, you know, just think about just your class. Don't just close the door and think this is my whole world, that there is a whole collaborative culture that you have to help to build. And I think I think they have to be creative. I think they need to be you know, outside of the box thinkers. I think they need to be able to look at how they are able to, you know, bring the real world into their classroom. Mm -hmm. I think they need to be able to think outside the box and to not be afraid to try something because their comfort level is a little bit lower. So I think they have to be a Mm -hmm. little bit of a risk taker because it, it is okay if it doesn't work. And, you know, to be able to think, okay, well, that doesn't work, then let's try to do something better. So that reflection piece is a really key key piece as well as a teacher leader. To be able to support those teachers and say, you know what, that didn't work, that's okay. world's not coming to an end. We're going to try to do something different or we're going to trash it because it really just didn't work at all. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that, that certainly seems to imply that as a school leadership team, then you have to create that environment that experimentation is good versus yes. failing is bad. Yes, and I think that was, we were presenting, I can't really remember where it was that we were presenting, but that was my aha moment when mm-hmm. a teacher leader, he was presenting, and they asked a similar question about being a teacher leader, and he said, you know, Miss Brown actually allows us to make mistakes, and she's okay with it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, in my mind, if they pitch an idea, I'm sitting here thinking, Mm, that will never work. But okay, you need to understand that it won't work. But me telling you that is not going to fix it. So you need to go ahead. And this is a this is obviously a conversation in my head. This is not what I say to them. You know, I just I think that you have to give them the ability to make those decisions and trust that they're going to try to do the best thing that they can because they have good intentions. They don't want to do bad. You know, that's the, that's the nature of a teacher. They right. want to, to do things right. And so I just think that you have to give them that professional freedom. Right. You know, there are some times when I'll say, oh, now, would you really want to think about, I ask, you know, I play devil's advocate, you know, and I really do try to think in different ways. Okay, ask them questions about how how is that going to look when you actually implement it. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, even in the processing stages, 
just allowing that conversation, it really does help. Mm-hmm. You know, Billy Donegan, she's one of our, our mentors, and we've learned a lot from her. And I think building that relationship with the academy leaders that Bridget and I have developed, you throw the skunks on the table, she says. You create that safe environment to be able to say, you know what, I don't like how that's working. And it's not that you're taking it personal. It's not, Nothing is personal. This is mm-hmm. just about what's best for the kids and what's best for, you know, the whole process, you know. And, and so I think just being able to develop those relationships, I think, is critical. Right, right. And uh, trust. Oh so, gosh, so, trust. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, let me finish up with, with two quick questions now. Um, so in terms of uh, as a leader, as the person instigating and helping lead this overall process, what's something that surprised you uh, in a positive sense that you that came out of this process? I think, you know, we've watched other schools go through this process. And I think what the, I think the biggest pleasant surprise is that when we chose to redesign this high school that we have been able to sustain, whereas others have not. So I think that's one of the biggest surprises. But I think it, even if I reflect on it, I shouldn't be surprised because our community has truly, the way we've embedded our community within our programs and the support that we have and the teacher buy-in and the belief that what we are doing is right for kids that's been the surprise. And to hear our students whenever we host schools and they do student panels and to hear them say that a teacher teaches like I like to learn and for them to say, you know, if I hadn't have gone to that internship, you know, I thought I wanted to be a a child care provider. I thought I wanted to do that. And then after two weeks in, I don't know that I want kids. You know, for them to have those aha moments, Mm -hmm. those have been truly you know, all the hard work that you put in, and then when you hear comments like that, that is, you know, validation that all the hard work is worth it. Great. And then the final question, uh, for other leaders who are just beginning this process, what's a word of advice that you would give to them? The staff, they call me the phaser, and so I truly believe in phasing in things. I think you focus on one thing at a time and you do that for a whole year you know you pick even with our professional development and we've done this from the very beginning I think professional development is huge I think educating the staff if they're looking at redesigning the high school why are you doing it you know what 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 are your goals I mean really reflect on what it is you do good and what is what it is that you need to improve on but you know reflection is the key but my whole thing is that you do one thing at a time mm-hmm. and then you reflect on it and then you revise it and celebrate it if it does great and then trash it if it doesn't so i really do i do work on that philosophy of you do one thing at a time excellent i would like to thank ms brown for joining us today and giving us the excellent presentation about the work of mountain home You'll see everyone's contact information there if you'd like to find out more about the work of the National Center for College and Career Transitions, or if you would like to directly contact Dana Brown or Bridget Shipman at Mountain Home High School Career Academies. And please look for parts two, three, and four of this series coming soon. Thank you.